Amen. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to Troy United Methodist Church. Those of you in person, those of you uh, joining online, it's, it's so good uh, to be together as we do, gosh, what, what the band just sang, uh, to meet face to face with the Lord. I love, I love that line. It just, it hit me. Oh, what a change it would bring just to sit at the feet of the King who gave it all. That's what we get to do, uh, whether we're in person or we're online as we gather together. You know, my name is Andy. Uh, I, I've had the privilege of being the senior pastor here at Troy United Methodist Church for uh, a little over three years now. And uh, you just need to know uh, how grateful I am to my uh, predecessor, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Dennis Price, who was here uh, for almost uh, three decades. Uh, Dennis and I, oh, we actually just uh, spoke this week. Uh, we, uh, we have many things in common. Uh, a lot of a lot of passions that we share, a lot of um, uh, sh- similar qualities uh, about us. But there, there's one thing that that stands out as a very just a very big distinction between the two of us. And quite honestly, I, it still is something that intimidates me. Dennis, Dennis has a couple of really sweet rides. Uh, and I'm not talking about his John Deere e- either. I've had the, the privilege of riding uh, a shotgun with Dennis in his uh, Ford Mustang as well as in uh, his uh, four-wheel drive Ford pickup and uh, really enjoy that. Really, I, I enjoy uh, riding as the passenger in, in a lot of people's vehicles. Um, uh, so much more joy than, than uh, driving my own. Uh, although I, I do have to admit I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for uh, my, my vehicles. They have one quality uh, that, is, that I love more than any other quality. They're paid off. Uh, but, but those of you who drive older vehicles, you know that they often develop their own little quirks. Uh, especially I found, uh, for me, uh, quirks in the electronic systems. Uh, for instance, our 2006 Chevy Suburban had a, uh, a fit a couple of years ago uh, and, and with, with its horn and all the built-in alarm systems that, oh goodness, I didn't even know were enabled. Uh, but but uh, they, would, they would just start randomly going off. In fact, it happened one time uh, just down the road from here right now where my wife was driving. And, and it all just started blaring and she didn't know what to do. And so I get this frantic call with all kinds of noise in the background. Uh, I don't know what's going on. And then, uh, then it, I didn't know what was going on because it stopped by the time I was there. Um, and that's how it always works, right? Uh, but then, then, then I got a taste of it just a couple of days later when it all started going off crazy in the garage in the middle of the night. Uh, that, was, that was a nasty wake-up call. But, but instead of paying thousands of dollars uh, to get a new steering wheel column um, installed, we decided just to pull the fuse on the horn. Problem solved. Uh, you know, I can get by without a horn, and I know those of you who know my driving style, you think, no. He can't, uh, but I can't. I really can get by without a horn. I just hit it, and, and that takes care of whatever stress I have inside. Uh, but but uh, but I can live. I can live without a horn. But but what really drives me nuts in old vehicles are the warning lights. The warning. Occasionally, uh, just in our suburban, uh, a warning light will come up that says uh, the tire sensors are bad. I know that's not true, because we just paid a, a whole load to get them replaced. Um, and and then I, then I'll get this warning to check the pressure of the tires, and this happens regularly. And I'll look at the tires; they look fine. I get out the pressure gauge, all 35 psi, looking good. Uh, uh, and, and you kind of get the picture, though. But just imagine, as you can imagine, after after a while, I start to not trust the warning lights, uh, and. That's a problem, right? Because warning lights, they're there to warn you when something is about to break down, when, when you need to tend to something really important because if you don't, it could cause irreparable damage. Friends, can I just be straight with you for a moment? 
I'm concerned. I'm concerned that for many of us, we have ignored our warning lights. We, we either don't trust what it is that they're saying to us, uh, or we know that deep down inside, if we deal with, with it, it's going to cost way more than we want to give. And I'm not talking about vehicles anymore. You know that. Yeah, I heard somebody recently refer to our country um, as America, uh, not, not, not land of the free, but America, uh, home of the rushed. Just think about some of the common phrases that we use in our everyday language. Uh, life in the fast lane, uh, time crunch, fast food, a rush hour. Uh, try thinking about the, the products that we buy or the companies that we buy from. Uh, we send packages through Federal Express. We use a phone company called Sprint. Uh, we, we manage our personal finances with QuickBooks. Uh, we schedule appointments in our day runner. Uh, and, and we diet with SlimFast. Uh, we, we wear, in our culture, we wear busyness as a badge of honor. And we, if we're honest, we tend to judge people around us who seem to have too much free time on their hands. We have so many more time-saving technologies at our disposal than, than even we had just 10 years ago. But, but they don't save us time. I mean, ultimately, they just allow us to cram more into our already overwhelmed schedules. And, and we're not paying attention to the warning lights. I mean, maybe it is that we don't trust them. Or maybe we think that if we deal with them, it's just going to cost us too much to fix the real problem. We'd rather just keep driving and risking, uh, risking damage, even if we're risking irreparable damage. But driving without paying attention to the warning lights, in this circumstance, friends, it's just, that it's just way too risky. And you don't want to end up being broken down on the side of the road with a heart attack or with diabetes. You don't want to be auctioned off for spare parts after you've had a mental or emotional breakdown despite the meds that you're taking. You don't want to find yourself stranded with a failed marriage or resentful relationships with your kids who are likely just trying to live at the same breakneck speed that you have modeled for them. You don't want to crash and burn and realize that your relationship with God is non-existent because you never slowed down enough to hear his voice. You know, the, the risks are too great to ignore these warning lights. You know, the good news, though, is that God has already showed us what to do in order to avoid a catastrophe in our analogy, it, it, you could call it routine maintenance or checking under the hood or, or maybe slowing down to enjoy the scenery. Uh, or if maybe you've got one of those cool new electric cars. Uh, you could call it recharging your battery. I really don't care what you call it, but God calls it Sabbath. It's our eighth and final core practice. Now, to understand what Sabbath is, we need to go way back. Well, way back into the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, referred to oftentimes as the Torah or the Pentateuch. Um, uh, you see, practicing Sabbath, uh, you probably already know this, is one of the Ten Commandments. And one of the big ten. And uh, whether you know this or not, there, there are actually two places in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, in the, the first five books of the Old Testament, where, uh, the, where the Ten Commandments are listed out. Two places. Uh, one is in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, the other is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And, and you know what? Uh, they are almost identical. You, you read them. It's, it, it's almost word for word. Uh, except for commandment number four regarding the Sabbath. 
And I'll let you take a deeper look for yourselves, but I just briefly summarize right now. Uh, they're, they're similar in, in, in the fact that they teach very clearly what, what they mean by Sabbath, that you are to work for six days and rest on the seventh day. Not only are you to rest, but all who work for you. You're, that could be employees, that could be, uh, that, that could be beasts of burden. All are to rest on the seventh day. But then they differ in the rationale. And it's not contradictory rationale. Uh, rather, I think the different rationale uh, give us two big reasons why practicing Sabbath is so important. So, so first, let's uh, take a look at Exodus 20. Uh, after giving the uh, basic commandment of resting on the seventh day, uh, working six and then resting on the seventh, uh, the rationale comes in chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Here we see that we are to practice the rhythm of this rhythm of work, rest, because that's the rhythm that God established in creation. Uh, we, we, we read about this in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, in the original Hebrew language here, the word uh, rest is the Hebrew word Shabbat, uh, which is, uh, is Sabbath. Uh, God, God worked. He created, but then God rested. And by resting, I, I mean that, that God ceased. He ceased his creating activity. And, and if God rested and called it holy, and we are created in the image of God, then we too are created to rest and to find it holy. But let's see some more rationale for Sabbath, uh, this time from the book of Deuteronomy and its version of the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, you are to work six days and then rest on the seventh. And then verse 15 in Deuteronomy 5, here's its rationale. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. I love, I, if I had to choose one or the other, I'd choose this one. I love this one. This is definitely my favorite one of the two. We receive the Sabbath commandment, because God wants us to know that we are no longer slaves. Slaves, the, the, the Hebrews, they were, they were slaves to Pharaoh, right? Slaves cannot take a day off from work, but free people can. Free people can. We are no longer identified or defined by our productivity or our strength. I mean, think about it. The, in, in God's kingdom, the weak, the weakest and the most fragile are just as valuable, are just as important as the strongest and the most productive. You, you know what? You, your identity is confirmed in your baptism. Um, in fact, I, I'm really excited about next week, our first comeback Sunday, uh, where we will be celebrating baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper together uh, at 10 a.m. outdoors. Uh, we'll, and you can drive up in your car and watch and listen from your car um, if you're kind of nervous about being around crowds still. But 10 a.m. Uh, next week outdoors, we're going to do our best to stream it live on Facebook. We can't get it on both while we're outdoors, but we'll get it on Facebook. So if you're a YouTube watcher, I'm sorry, but we'll, we'll be streaming on Facebook. But 10 a.m. next week, Baptism Sunday, uh, our first comeback Sunday. Uh, but I, I'm excited about it because we're going to be able to celebrate that our identity is confirmed in our baptism. And it's not just confirmed in our baptism, it's sealed by the Holy Spirit that 
that our identity is a child of God, that we are a child of God. We're not a slave. We're not slaves to God. We are children of God. You are free to take Sabbath rest because your productivity, your strength does not define you. You are no longer a slave. So don't live like a slave. Now let's fast forward to Jesus and the New Testament. You know, in Jesus' time, there were a couple of different approaches to practicing Sabbath. Um, At one end of the spectrum, you had uh, a group of Jews called the Herodians. Uh, These were Jews who, I mean, they were, they were, uh, ethnically Jewish, uh, they, they had Jewish background, but for lack of a better description, they were secularized. Uh, they, they called themselves Jews, but they were, hev- they were heavily influenced by Greco-Roman culture. And, and so they no longer held fast to the Jewish way of life, to uh, the Jewish customs, including the Sabbath. Uh, and they, they were called Herodians because this was the philosophy of the Herods, uh, the, the Jewish kings who were supported by the Roman authorities. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you had the Pharisees. Uh, they held fast to all of the Jewish customs and the Old Testament laws. And you know what? They took great pride in it. Uh, in fact, they, they judged others who did not obey the law in the same way that they did. So their their observance of Sabbath was very legalistic, just very condemning and judgmental. Uh, And they tried to pull this with Jesus, this attitude with Jesus. And we'll get to that in a moment. But but it's important to know uh, that, that the Herodians and the Pharisees, these two very distinct Jewish groups, that they were They were deep, deep, deeply rooted enemies. Their entire approach to life was polar opposites. These weren't just political opinions. This was the entire, their entire way of life. And so they were uh, deep enemies and opposed to each other. And and that will become important in a moment. But in Mark chapter 2 and 3, we find that, that Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees about Sabbath, uh, Sabbath practice. Uh, they, were, they were having conflict over activity that Jesus and his disciples took part in on the Sabbath. In chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 23 through 26, they condemned Jesus and his disciples for picking grain and eating it uh, on the Sabbath, which technically speaking, that was considered work. To harvest was, was work. And so uh, that was considered work. But Jesus then responded and he taught this very important biblical principle about Sabbath in verses 27 and 28. Then Jesus said to them, he said, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is... This is A very, very important teaching. Jesus said that Sabbath was made for you, not you for the Sabbath. Now, the Pharisees didn't like this at all. It didn't fit in their world view. Uh, And then immediately afterwards, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus went into a synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he just was real bold, and and he asked everybody there, largely Pharisees, uh, and he said, what, what, uh, is it lawful to do good? Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? And he was really referring to uh, healing of a man with a withered hand. And, and, and you know what? Nobody answered. They're like, oh man, uh, I don't know. I don't know. If I answer this way, that's bad. If I answer this way, that's bad. So they just shut up. And, it, and Jesus, the Bible says, was deeply angered. He was deeply angered because they they missed the point of the Sabbath. Either on one end of the spectrum, they totally ignored it, or on the other end of the spectrum, they were judgmental and, and legalistic like the Pharisees. They missed 
that the Sabbath was a good gift from God to us, to people, as a means of giving and restoring life. And then after Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, which, which he did, uh, it made the Pharisees so mad, so unbelievably mad that, that the scriptures say that they, they began to make plans with their enemies, the Herodians, in order to kill Jesus. Jesus was teaching an important, such an important part of the kingdom perspective on Sabbath. And the rest of the Old Testament picks this up and, and runs with it, with this theme. You, you see, and I want you to hear this clearly. Followers of Jesus in God's kingdom are not required to observe the Sabbath laws of the Old Testament. Paul says as much in Galatians chapter 2. In fact, you can, you, you can dive in and read that. Um, in God's kingdom, you are not required to observe the Sabbath laws of the Old Testament. It is not a commandment for you any longer. However, Jesus makes it clear that Sabbath rest is for people. It is a gift. You you need it. I need it. Even Jesus needed it. In Jesus' life, he had to slow down, retreat, spend time in prayer. He had to sleep. He he had to uh, cease from work in order to be rejuvenated and refreshed. Jesus had physical, mental, and emotional limits too. That was a part of Jesus' humanity. And he modeled for us how to practice Sabbath. Rest is God's gift. We were not made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for us. Therefore, practicing Sabbath is a core practice for anyone, anyone who follows Jesus. A Sabbath is setting aside time, a day each week to intentionally rest, contemplate, and delight in God. And you don't have to write that down or remember it uh, uh, yourself because it's on your, your eight core practices bookmark. It's, it's number eight. Uh, it's right there for you. Sabbath is setting aside a day each week to intentionally rest, contemplate, and delight in God. And, and, and this is what Sabbath looks like. I, I want to briefly highlight uh, four aspects of Sabbath rest uh, that are part of this definition that can help you begin to live out this core practice in your life. And I've borrowed these from a a fantastic book by Pete Scazzaro called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Uh, when, When you practice Sabbath, you do these four things. You stop, you rest, you delight, and you contemplate. You stop first. You are... You are always going to find reasons why you can't or you won't stop. But Sabbath requires that you cease from your work. God is, not on, the, uh, uh, God is on the throne, not, not you. If you stop for a day, the world is not going to collapse. You are not God. I, I am not God. St- stopping stopping is, a, is an act of great trust that, that during those 24 hours, God will hold together all of your unfinished work. Will take care of uh, the, the, all the piles that are left on your desk. That God will hold things together even when you've got all those undone to-do lists. To practice Sabbath is to say to God, God, you know what? I, I trust that you are at work while I am at rest. You are God. I am not. Can you trust God enough to stop 
and cease your frantic activity. But what do you do when you stop? You rest. God rested on the seventh day. We are to rest. Uh, how, how should you fill all the time that you have then? Just a one really long nap? Uh, no, it did Do whatever delights you, whatever replenishes you. Sabbath was made for you. Pete Scazzaro says, when we stop and rest, we respect our humanity and the image of God in us, that we are not nonstop human beings. So take a nap. Enjoy a hike, read a book, watch a good movie, spend time with those you love. Take a rest from technology, from hurriedness, from lists, and from exhaustion. Rest. Also learn to delight. Delight in what God has given you. After God created, he delighted in his creation. He looked over it and called it good, called it very good. Well, when you practice Sabbath, take time to delight in the good that is around you. Enjoy food. Enjoy play. Enjoy relationships. Enjoy nature. Enjoy hobbies. Enjoy life. It's a gift. And as you learn to rest and delight, don't forget to contemplate God. Turn your thoughts to God often. This could easily and should include many of the other core practices that we studied, like worship, community, scripture, and prayer. When you learn to slow down and simply be with God in these ways, like the song that was just sung over us, you will begin to become attuned to God's voice. A voice that cannot be heard in the frantic pace of busyness. Now, doesn't that sound amazing? Doesn't that sound like healing balm for your weary soul? Can you imagine a life that that lived in this Sabbath rhythm. And you know what? Although Sabbath uh, technically in the scriptures is defined as, as a 24-hour period, uh, once a week, uh, Sabbath principles uh, apply to daily life and weekly and monthly and yearly life and your, your entire life. If you practice Sabbath, you will be reminded that you are a human being and not a human doing You will be more fully present with others and not hurried. You you are far less likely to burn out physically, mentally, and emotionally. And, And spiritually speaking, you will more easily hear the voice of God. Now, now do you know why that sounds amazing? Do, Do you know why? It's because you were created to experience that. One more thing about Sabbath from a biblical perspective. Um, Sabbath rest is a foretaste of things to come. Although there is every biblical indication that that, uh, we will continue to work in our eternal existence. It will be the kind of restful work that mirrors God's original intent. When we experience the new heavens and the new earth, our souls will be at rest. And and Jesus offers a taste of that here and now. And he extends that invitation to you and to me. You've heard this passage before, Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, uh, upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle, I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
That's what I need. Rest. God's rest. Rest for my soul. How about you? Jesus is offering us God's rest. He's not offering a mere day off. He's inviting you and me to the kind of rest that we were created to experience, the kind of rest that eludes many of us and certainly eludes most of our culture these days. Well, the rest that Jesus offers comes exclusively from a relationship with him. And he says, come to me and I will give you rest. The the only way that you can experience that taste of God's rest is through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, beginning a journey with him. And journeying with him is restful. Hear this, it is restful even in the midst of whatever chaos is swirling around in your life. You know, I've been reflecting that our pandemic reality has um, in many ways forced us to slow down. Some of us have really appreciated it. Others of us, though, if we're honest, have hated it. And, and I and, and I just have to say, if, if you have found yourself hating it, just pushing back and fighting against the slower pace, just really spend some time, slow down and spend some time asking the question, why? It very well could be that there are some things underneath the hood that you've been ignoring for far too long and you're not sure you want to pay the cost of having those looked at and fixed and worked on. But for me, this pandemic shutdown has been a mixed bag. Now, I've been, I, I've truthfully been thankful for the slower pace, for um, just a time to breathe and, and more time at home and to be with my family. But at the same time, March through June, uh, I was working more and harder than I ever had before. And on top of that, I had no boundaries anymore between work and, uh, and home. Uh, because just like many of you, I was working from home. Uh, I, I know many of you experienced that reality too. I, I had no safe space anymore for just God or for just my family. Or or even just for me, like the lines were all blurred and my rhythms were all out of whack and I was emotionally, spiritually exhausted. Um, My warning lights, (laughs) they were all on and they were blinking and and calling out to me. Uh, But but thankfully, uh, after completely unplugging for two weeks in July, at the end of July, I I felt God remind me of my deep need for healthier Sabbath rhythms in my life. I was reminded that that more than anything else, um, the best thing that I have to offer you as the chief shepherd, as the senior pastor of Troy United Methodist Church is not everything that I'm doing as much as it is a heart and life that passionately pursues Jesus, that has an intimate and healthy relationship with God and with others. Without that, all my doing is fruitless. And you know what? Um, That's the same thing. That's the That's the best thing that you have to offer the people who depend on you most in your life. And if you want an intimate and healthy relationship with God and with others, you'll need to find God's rest and live into the core practice of Sabbath as you journey with Jesus. Now, as our closing prayer, I'd like to share this prayer uh, that a friend of mine wrote uh, for 
his own weekly rhythms of Sabbath, when he begins his Sabbath time each week, he, he prays this prayer. And it's, it's a powerful prayer, simple and powerful, and one that I would invite you to make your own. So uh, for those of you who are here in person, let's, let's stand together. Um, and maybe if you're at home, um, even if you're in a recliner, you know, find, find a new position, one where you are, you are submitting yourself to God, even just uh, for this moment in this, in this prayer. So let's, let's join our hearts. Lord, come quickly to save me. While I rest, fix that which I have broken. Do that which I have left undone. Hold together all that I am tempted to control. Protect me from distractions within and distractions outside. Remind me of your love. Prepare me to serve you faithfully. Envelop my loved ones in your grace and your kindness. And do what only you can do, especially for the vulnerable. Come quickly, Lord, to save me. And all of God's people agreed and said, Amen.